yep we're on now so that's good so hopefully folks are joining us i'm gonna try to go see what my ipad is doing <laughs> so if you're on you can put in chat and say hello happy friday it is friday my days are all messed up lately because you're traveling i think between covid and traveling <laughs> my days are weird yeah. if anyone is on i'm gonna go check our little facebook page but if anyone's on just Put something in the chat box, tell us where you're from, tell us that you're here, so we know everything's working. Let's see here. There's some people that are here, that's good. Now I'll have to go. Katrin, is your place under construction now? I think she's under construction, so. I want to hear all about that. Virginia, Edmund, Andrew. It's a lot of friendly names friendly we know. Name. Kimberly and Linda. So awesome. All right. Well, I'm clearly on the wrong page of my Facebook thing on my iPad. So just talk amongst yourself for a second. <laughs> Robin gets caught up. So we're glad you guys are here. Oh, demo time. That's. Got a demo oh, before. Demo. Demo so of perfect. Perfect. That's exciting. It's probably more fun than sitting around just doing paperwork and waiting for something to happen. So that's exciting. Hey, Lena. I was over your direction yesterday in Kerrville. So Arizona, I'm sure it's warm there. Pam from the UK, happy you're on. My awesome. We're really just going to chat. So if you guys have questions on um, hiring and what we're really focused on is hiring and building a team of 18 players. And so I think first, maybe you guys could put in chat. Let's talk about what characteristics make someone an 18 player versus just, you know, we, you have, you need all kinds in your centers, but you really want to have a strong core of 18 players. So maybe we can kind of brainstorm a list of 18 um, attributes. Yeah, what you want in your employees. Because that's the place you need to start. Because if you don't know what your ideal candidate looks like, it's hard to benchmark when you're interviewing how close someone is to that um, list of attributes. So Courtney said intent. That's a good one. A team player has an awesome positive attitude. I think that's so important. Yes. So positive attribute, integrity. Integrity is a good one. I always wanted people that were nice too, which kind of goes with the positive attitude, but um, I want nice people. <laughs> Dependability, yeah. reliability, commitment, not a job, but a career. Those are all awesome, Edmund. Proactive is good. Proactive. So, yeah, I think, you know, not everyone, if you have a, a large center, not everyone's probably there for a career, but distinguishing that you can have a career in pet care and looking for people that are seeking that and then also having, you know, the education and the career path is going to help you, I think, um, attract some 18 players. Yeah. And Andrew said commitment too. And I do think a lot of, a lot of pet care facilities that we work with do have young adults. And I will tell you from my own daughter's perspective, she's a young adult. Um, and actually my son has said this as well. He's also a young adult, but they were, when they were in their early twenties, they're in their later twenties now, but they talked a lot about the fact that they didn't, they didn't even know certain things were careers. They, it's not really something they are taught in school. So I remember a conversation I had with my daughter one time where she was like, I was talking to someone at you know an event she went to and she was like, that person does X, Y, Z. And she's like, I didn't even know you could do that as a career. And I think there's a lot of people who 
look to get into the pet industry when they're young adults because they're just looking for a job and they have no idea that that could be a career. And it really is up to you or whoever is their supervisor or manager to make sure they understand that that's a possibility. And, and if you give them an opportunity to advance now, they may or may not want that career, but we at least need to make sure they understand it is a career and it's a viable career that they can make money at. So I think that I do think that's important. So Kimberly said, people oriented. Um, Mai said, not just looking for a job, someone looking for long-term position, actually working with animals. So that's all the, all those same principles, which is awesome. So really the step is build that out for your ideal candidate. And, you know, what are the most important attributes? Which ones are like deal killers versus which ones can you work with um, and work through is kind of your first step to identifying the 18 players. And then think about how are you going to identify during your um, recruiting and interviewing process, whether they have those traits or not. And there's, you know, different ways you can do that as far as um, how you set up questions, how you set up scenarios, um, the key thing is you're going to want to make sure that at the end of your um, interview process that you have a feel for where they fit and how, how high they score in those areas that are important to you. Yeah, Mai said, this is an interesting one because she said, my pet peeve is applicants listing. I'm looking for a foot in the door to, the, to vet nursing. Um, the, and I would agree with that. Like if you know, sometimes you're going to know in advance that maybe they're not looking for a long-term position with your job, with your company. Um, on the other hand, there, those people who are looking for, do you know how many people I've talked to, including myself when I was little, younger, I'll say, uh, and little, I wanted to be a vet. So I had that in my head until I figured out, ah, I don't know, I don't want to be a vet. I don't want to deal with all the sick animals. I don't want to deal with blood and all that. So I can, I can get why that's sort of a, I don't want that person because they're trying to just get a step in the right direction for another career outside of my facility. But on the other hand, they might change their mind. So, and if they are really good, it's, it's probably worth, trying if all other things are equal if they're a good candidate and fit all of your characteristics that you're looking for it might not be a bad hire because you may find that they'll stay with you yeah and i think it goes back to what you said robin is that you know people think of veterinarian and vet techs and vet nursing as careers and a lot of times on the service side they don't realize there's careers within the service side as well it's just not as visible to the general public as the veterinarian side so the other thing I guess we should back up a little bit to say before you even hire someone, you do have to know exactly what their job is going to be. And I say that, and most of you are probably thinking, well, of course, but we do find that lots of businesses don't have job descriptions. And especially when you first open, you're kind of a jack of all trades. So I get it. Like when you're first hiring, you're just like, I need somebody that can just do everything because you don't have a lot of room for multiple staff members initially, but you still want to make a job description. Even if that job description says you're going to do a little bit of everything, you're going to do some lodging, you're going to do some daycare, you're going to do some admin. You still need to have a job description because you really want to start with that person coming on board, knowing exactly what they're going to do. And then we would recommend reviewing those job descriptions at least once a year. If you are just in the growing stage and you grow pretty quickly, you might have to do it even more often and have continual conversations to make sure your staff is actually doing what their job is. A lot of frustration comes out with the staff because you hired them for one thing and they end up doing something totally clear, totally different. And in a lot of situations, the totally different in the employee's eyes is something harder or something with more responsibility or something that in their mind should equate to an increase in pay, which is, which is valid. And that's why you want to look at those job descriptions and make sure it hasn't morphed into something else and just be clear with your staff as to what you really want them to do. Without those job descriptions, it's really hard, number one, to hold them accountable 
because what are you holding them accountable to? What the thoughts in your head? Because that's that's how a lot of us hold people accountable. It's like my, what I have in my head, you're not doing. I don't have it written down, but I just expect you to do it. And that's just not fair. So that helps you to hold account, hold them accountable. It also helps you to understand what work has to be done at your facility and break it out into whether it's one employee or 20, break it out into everybody's different role. And you might have people with the same, multiple people with the same role, but they're still working off of a job description that tells them exactly what you expect of them. And obviously that also helps them know before they apply for the job, if it's the right job for them. So I would, I guess we should back up to that point as well. Yeah. And making, you know, one thing today to attract 18 players and even the best candidates, you need to look at recruiting as almost like marketing your business and why it is the place to work. And, I was doing a little poking around and some research before we got on and there's actually um, services out there to make a job description more visual, either like with pictures or with um, almost like a little mini slideshow to be a little video to explain what the job is. And it's a great way to do testimonials if you have people that are already in the job that you think are 18 players let them tell their story as to why they like working at your business and use that on a career page. You should have, you know, a careers page at your business if you're wanting to hire and you can explain your company's story. What is your mission, your values? Why, what impact are you making in the community with pet families? Why should they choose your pet business over the one down the street and tell your story to help them, see themselves working there and wanting to be a part of your business. And, and I will say that the young adults these days, so I'm in my fifties when I was in high school and college, early college, looking for a job, I, I was just looking for anything that would make me some money. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I just wanted money. <laughs> so I feel like nowadays, the young adults nowadays that are looking for jobs, they want a job, they want money, but they also want to make an impact. I think, not that I never wanted to make an impact when I was younger, but it was not in my head the same way I think it is now for the generations that are coming up behind my generation. So I think what you're saying, Susan, is really important because why would they work for your company? And the fact that you're helping animals, the fact that maybe you have a side mission with a rescue group, the fact that you maybe give back to your community by helping schools or whatever it is, those things are important to um, the A team players that you want, at least today's A like player. And so really making that a part of your marketing, I think is really important because you don't just want them to come and have a job. But I will tell you that some of the 18 players, they want to make sure that they are making a difference. They want to make sure that they're doing a good job and that there's a bigger mission than just cleaning kennels. And so I do think that's really important, especially for today's hiring. I am going to put a link to, um, do you want to talk a little bit about AHA, AHA Business Consulting? Because I was going to put their link. Yeah. Um, we use a lot of their resources. Yeah. Andrea Hoffer is someone that Robin and I met through our coaching program who has AHA Consulting and she can help you um, hire and onboard and even identify um, the right type of candidate that you're looking for. Um, she's scheduled to speak at our conference in March that we had to um, cancel, but we, I still follow her page and get her newsletter and she has some good ideas. And actually she puts out things that I haven't heard other people talking about um, as far as the HR realm. So um, if you, I would just go sign up um, to, um, get her information, but she, we know several people she's helped work with and she works a lot with um, frontline service businesses. She has done some pet services. She's done some spas. So she, we had, um, and we, we hope to have her um, at our 2021 event in April in February, but, or gosh, April. <laughs> um, but if you can get to know her and follow her earlier, you may come up with some good stuff. But she has a, a recent newsletter where she talked about 
creating a career website and what should you include in that, which is your company story about your mission, your vision. And as Robin said, highlighting anything you're doing that's beyond just your business, because it's not motivating for someone to come work for you and feel like all they're doing is helping you make money. They do want to take care of the dogs, but anything that you're doing in the community, and we know so many of you are, the problem is you're not always good at telling your own story and tooting your own horn, but those types of things to be highlighted on your um, webpage would help. And I definitely would do little testimonials from employees that are long-term 18 players you have on board, what they like best working there. Um, and let video tell more of the story and bring your business to life. I think will help and always be, accepting resumes, have a big button there and an application. I was going to say, you oh, yeah. You're good with buttons. what color should the button be, Ron? Orange, do it with an orange button, <laughs> orange or blue. Um, no, yeah, that's what I was going to say is always be hiring. I think a lot of us get really stressed out because somebody quits and then we're like, crap, we need to hire right away. And that's really not the best way to hire. I realize that that, that happens often, but if you are always taking resumes and sometimes you'll go back to somebody and they've always already found a job, that doesn't mean you can't still offer them another job. And um, sometimes that works and sometimes you'll find that they're not interested anymore, but still having a, a pool of people is a great way to help alleviate some of the stress that happens when you need to hire. The other thing that helps is making sure that you are always kind of planning for secession. So if you have, you know, five employees and it's, you know, getting ready for the holidays in the back of your head, you might be thinking I might need to bring on some temporary work. Or if you know that somebody came on in January and they said, I'm moving in October, don't wait till October to start looking for someone like you need to have that in the forefront of your head to say, I need to be planning to replace this person because I know they're leaving. Sometimes you don't always know, but as much as you can, you want to make sure that you have kind of a pool of people that you can look at. And I will say some of the things that we're talking about, you're probably in the back of your head thinking, my employees don't care about that. They're not going to watch a video about, I'm telling you the A team players will. The people that you really want to hire, these are the things that they are going to, that's going to resonate with them. So if you're kind of shaking your head, like, I don't know, a career page seems silly or whatever, then you're probably missing out on some of the great employees that are gonna go to that page and say like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I really wanna work with this company. So don't, uh, you know, don't, Discount it before you try it, I guess, is my point. And I have to go back to, I remember back to the days when, you know, we were hiring people and we would get frustrated because they didn't remember that, you know, we had to work holidays and that cleaning was a big part of it and picking up poop and cleaning up vomit. So we would paint the ugliest, nastiest picture of the worst part of the job and make sure they knew all the bad stuff up front. And we don't want to hide the bad stuff, but I think you need to include it in a way that is more subtle and don't make your video about all of the bad stuff or the don'ts or the must haves. It needs to be selling them on this opportunity and talking about the rewards and joys and the opportunities of learning dog behavior. If you're managing groups and ensuring, you know, all lives, you know, puppies come into the world and become well-adjusted dogs and seniors have love and care and support on their way out and some of the rewards. And this is where I would interview and maybe even do a lunch and learn with your current team to talk about, you know, why, what are the good things? What do you like? You know, when clients bring you food, you know, find the good things and highlight those and then slip in some of the stuff that's necessary, but not make it just all the do's and don'ts and yeah, so Edmund, Edmund was asking about that, that sort of sample career page. So that's just really a page where you have, you are able to take job description. I mean, uh, resumes where you have information about your company, where you have your company story, where you might have videos from current employees and just really talks about why it's great to work with you. And I would talk about the fact that, that your company is a place where they could learn additional skills, not just 
the skills for whatever job you're hiring, but hopefully you have some kind of career path for them. So if somebody comes in as a uh, daycare, I mean, as a lodging counselor, you might be able to tell them, hey, we can also teach you how to do daycare, or you might end up learning some enrichment, or you might end up becoming a dog trainer. Like we have a lot of opportunities for you. That's what you really want to focus on. I think it's, it's interesting to me that in all, not just in the pet care industry, but in lots and lots of industries, people get frustrated because there's a high turnover. So they say this person, you know, they only ever work for a year or two and then they go somewhere else. Well, if you ask yourself, if they don't go somewhere else, what do you have for them? And most pet care facilities say nothing. Well, it is kind of unlikely that somebody wants to spend their entire career doing just one thing in one facility. And I will say, especially the days of my generation and older of working one job for their whole career are very rare. It's actually, I think the last time I look at the statistics, uh, people, young adults are changing careers pretty frequently. And part of that is because they are looking for something different. They do want something novel. They do want something new and exciting. But if you're not able to offer that to them, they are going to go somewhere else. On the other hand, if you can let them know there is room and this is where you have to have some kind of career path within your facility, you can tell them you can come in as this level and then you might be able to change over to this position. And then if you want to become a groomer or you want to become a trainer, we have programs that we can send you to to help you do that. Like there's a way to start making money. You, If you want to be in a leadership position, we have a way that you know, if you have those attributes that we can put you in a manager role or we can put you in a GM role or whatever it is. And obviously you're not promising them that, but you want to let them know that's a possibility because otherwise they are going to leave because most your, especially your A team players, they want more responsibility as they get better. Those are the people that want that you want to have stay around anyway. So I do think that's really important. As far as sample career pages, I know, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I would check like Zappos and some of the places that um, are considered some of the best places to work and just look at it from a template point of view and then create your own that portrays your brand. Or if any of you guys that are on feel like you've got a good career page on your website that you're willing for others to look at, you know, feel free to post it um, in the chat box. Cause I, I don't know how much focus has been put on that. I know when Dave and Jess Zelmer had their place um, in Virginia, they had a pretty good page and that's where they got most of their um, applicants was through their career page, but I don't, they don't have that anymore. So I don't have a good one off the top of my head to share. So talk a little bit about what things that you might want to do in the ad to help to find those 18 players. In the ad. <laughs> but if you guys have any comments on that, you can post them or things that you have found work really well when you're doing your ads. Um, I have a couple things, but I'll let Susan go first. I think you want to focus on um, why they should choose your business. You want to get their attention with um, words and describing the role and your business as an opportunity. Um, so careers and pet care would be language I would use. Um, go ahead and share yours, Robin. I was going to say, <clears throat> so someone asked about background checks. So we'll go back to that in a second. I was going to say, making sure that the job description is there, making sure what all of the story company story is there. And then you may want to have them do a few tasks in advance. And I do think this is a good way to, kind of rule out some people. I know a lot of the hiring softwares that are out there now or recruiting softwares that are out there now allow you to, you know, do kind of a, do these things before you apply or in order to apply, you have to do these things. And it might be everything from sending a letter. Um, one of our profit network members just talked about, we're waiting to get an update on how well this worked, but she talked about having somebody um, answer a couple questions on video, which I thought was a really cool idea. And that video goes to her team, her hiring team, so they can walk, they can look at that. That, which is, I think, a really interesting 
novel way of getting to see the person before you ever actually get on the phone or in person for an actual interview, but it's part of the screening process. Because right off the bat, we all know this, right off the bat, you're gonna lose a whole bunch of people who just don't follow instructions. So that's a good screening tool to use because those are probably not your 18 players who are not following instructions right from the start when they should actually be trying to make a good impression. Um, any kind of uh, letter that you have them send you or video that you have them send you gives you an idea of answering a couple of questions that might help you to further select who you would want to actually bring in for an interview. And it's not foolproof, but I do think things like that can help you to uh, go through the screening process and maybe screen a, a few things out ahead of time, and save you a little bit of, a little bit of time. Yeah, because professional pet care requires a attention and focus to a lot of details. So having things like Robin said, answering additional questions that you want video versus, you know, a reply is do they pay attention and read and focus on details and why that's so important for the health and well-being of the pets. And then we had a couple questions, a couple people, Courtney um, and May all asked about doing working interviews, we get them in for the morning and get them straight into cleaning. Um, you find out who's useless and following instructions really quickly. So I do think that working interviews, Courtney also asked, would you recommend working interviews? I do think working interviews are helpful. I do think it lets you see a little bit about how people are around dogs, um, possibly how much initiative they have. I don't think they're foolproof either, but I, I do think they're a good idea. I don't know if you did. I did those at my facility. I don't know if you did those, Susan. Yeah, we did them and I did really like them. And what we would do is in the working interview, we took them straight into our body slammer room just to see the level of comfort. And I'll never forget the girl that stood there like this the whole time. And Francis asked her at the end, like, so do you think you'd like to do this? And she goes, yeah, I think it'd be fine. And you're like, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we like that. Now we would never start them in the actual job in the body slammer room, but it was for effect. The thing I would do now that I didn't do because I didn't think of it, this is where, you know, time and age helps. I would have described the body language and what was going on in the play group while, while I were there and see, did they ask questions Did they even seem interested in like learning the body language and the things you're describing. And if they had no interest in what I was describing to them that was going on with the dogs, then I probably wouldn't hire at that point now because I want someone who wants to learn and be, think that stuff's cool. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Katrin, so going back to, do you think we should do background checks? I would actually do background checks these days. I think, um, I think you have to hire first. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I would do. Yeah, I would definitely hire first. But yeah, I think they one more way of protecting your company from potential issues. And again, not going to be foolproof. But for me, there's a lot of stuff I would do at my business that are just like to cover my butt. And so that would be one of them. I would do background checks just to make sure that I haven't hired someone who has some kind of a you know, criminal background or animal abuse or, you know, whatever it is, just to say I have done that as a safety precaution. It's also a nice thing to be able to promote. It's also something I would tell people in, in advance that you do those, which might help some people not apply for the job if they know that that's going to be part of the process. Um, but it also is something you can market as well. So I don't know if you have any other opinions on that, Susan. Yeah, I, th I think you have to decide up front what does a what coming out of the background check is going to be a no-go and it may vary by position because we would say um because a lot of people have stuff in their past and so how far back can something be are you going to give no second chances or are you going to give some does it depend on the severity of what it is because you can get some loyal employees that have trouble finding a job because they aren't able to give second chances now you know, a line for us is I'm not going to have someone that's handling money that has any theft. That's a no-go. Um, we have people that would spend the night at our center. So again, no theft or anything, that was a no-go. But for an animal care person that might have had, you know, a low-level theft that would be supervised, I might give that a chance if it was far enough back. So I think you've got to go through and think about each position. What are the no-goes on the background check? 
for your business and your brand. Yeah. And the other thing is we actually have worked with company. This goes back to your brand. We've actually worked with companies who part of their mission was to help um, folks who were coming out of those types of situations where they had gotten into trouble and they were using the job as a way to rehabilitate and reintroduce them into society. So for those people, the background check is, was not as pertinent because they actually were specifically hiring um, people that had problems. So, and we're trying to help them to start a new life. So, you know, it, it does really depend on your brand, but I do think background checks are a good, a good thing to, to do. It's just good to know what the issues are and you can talk to people about it. And sometimes again, you can compare because a lot, most applications ask if you've had been convicted of certain levels of crime. And then if you find on the background check that they didn't tell you, then you can release them for um, not being honest in their application. But I had some conversations with people. I had some really good employees that were truly trying to turn their life around, but I was very urban Houston. And so, you know, that was something we ran across quite frequently. So Jess just said, uh, we work release inmates are eager, eager to work on holidays and weekends. So there you go. Um, Edmund had said when we were talking about um, asking questions, pre questions or what test you want to do. He said they have candidates for front reservations, do a telephone interview automated where they are asked questions real time. And then we get the sound files and share which so they can kind of hear how that person sounds on the phone, which I think is really critical again, depending on that job. If that person's whole job is dependent on being on the phone, I do think that's a great idea as well. Um, and then I will say, um, do you want to talk about onboarding Susan? Like why oh, yeah. that makes a difference? Cause that's one of our favorite topics is how right. you bring someone on. So I will tell you, this is, this is how I see most facilities hire a person. They hire a person, the first, day one, you're so excited because you finally got somebody to work. And so you spend the day, usually that first day, kind of having them fill out paperwork. You walk them around, you show them where the lunch or break room is, where, you know, they're introduce them to the other employees that are there that day, kind of show them the layout of the facility, start teaching them a few things. And then by the end of the day, you know, they go home and you're just excited. Day two, they come in and you're like, I don't have time. I got some stuff to do. So you call like another one of your employees over and you go, Hey, can you just take, you know, new employee a around and show them some things and day. And then that's how that day goes. You have really not really sure what they learned, but whatever, someone was with them all day. And then day three, you're like over it. <laughs> and I'm not saying this is everybody on this Facebook live. I'm saying this is a lot of people we talk to this, is how they hire their people. Day three, you have no time. Cause now there's like a million fires you're trying to put out and you just hope that somebody's with that employee teaching them something. And that is kind of how onboarding goes for a lot of people. And I, that's how I onboarded. So I get it. I mean, my first employee I hired, and if you've read all about dog daycare, this story is in that book. My first employee I hired, I was so excited to have an employee that I just left her with seven dogs and I went to lunch. I was like, woo. -hoo! And I ended up having an injury that day when I came back from lunch. It was not a serious injury, but I get it. I mean, I get it that sometimes we don't put much thought into training staff, but I do think for your A team players, it's one of the most important things you can do to I recognize and identify and keep the A team players. So that's my uh, intro, Susan. I'll throw it over to you for that. Well, yeah, definitely have a plan of how you're going to introduce them to the company, your culture, as well as how to do their job. And there should be formal training with the knowledge they need and then the on the job portion where you need to show them, you know, how to mix your chemicals for disinfectant and how they actually clean. And again, having the SOPs to use as your training tool, either video or written or checklist is important because we get to this, you guys do it. It's so routine that you think it should be easy for people to pick up, but you go too fast. And then, you know, it, it training is a process where you explain it, you show, you do it and they watch you. And then you, and depending on the complexity of it, then you may have them do it while you observe them. And then you need to constantly be checking back, but you should have a plan of what are you going to introduce them to you? We need to get these people productive as soon as we can.
So having the process flow, I mean, I've seen people posting about the 90 day probationary period, which is really the training period. So what are you showing them week one? And then what are you showing them day one, day two within the week? And so onboarding is so important to keep your players engaged and not getting disillusioned with their choice of companies that um, they don't come back from lunch. And I remember I just wanted to kill my employees when new employees would like, they'd go to lunch and they're like, well, we hope you come back. It's like, don't even put that in their head. <laughs> We're not horrible. <laughs> we hope you come back. I like it. So I just want, we're going to keep talking, but for those who are on the call, I just want to know how long do you guys think it should take to train a new employee? So for, for like a entry job, so whether it's daycare, they just are starting to run at work in the daycare or they're going to be one of your lodging counselors. Like how long do you think it should take for them to learn their job and be able to basically come to work and just go work and not have, any supervision. I just want to, I just want to see what people think about that just out of curiosity. Um, but in the meantime, I am going to go back to saying the more, the high capacity employees that we all want, those 18 players we all want, I can tell you what they want is organization, the ability to think and learn on their own and the ability to do things on their own and the ability to make a difference. So when you hire somebody that is an A team player and they come to work and it's all chaotic and there's no real plan and they're just kind of learning whatever somebody wants to tell them. And remember, if they're an A team player and you pair them with someone who is not an A team player, that's even worse because now they're being taught by someone that they're like, this person doesn't even seem like they know what they're doing. They showed up late to work and now they're going to teach me. I'm telling you, these are the things that A team players are going to say. Because I've done, I mean, I'm an 18 player. I like to, I like to work hard, but I like to have a mission. I like to know what I'm doing. I like to know that I can make a difference. If I walk into a, if in, this was when I was younger, when I was working for others, when I would walk into something and it seemed chaotic, I was like, I ain't staying here. That's exactly what they think. So this is critical for those of you that are having like a revolving door of turnover you need to take a look at how you're training because the people that will stay in that kind of chaos, if they don't have an opportunity to help to change that environment are probably not the people you actually want. So it's really important. All right. So let me go see what people are saying here. So two weeks to have up to five dogs, three months to know their job at a first level, um, one and a half to two weeks. Our employees go through Dogaroo's videos, fetch find videos and training checklists, two to three weeks, depending on their experience. Um, 10 full day shifts of training at Anchor's Kennel. So anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months for, for what most people are saying. And I think that's fair. I think for, I think generally speaking, to have a full breadth of knowledge of a position, it's gonna take a couple of months. I think for, like somebody said, Stacy said up to five dogs. I think for daycare, larger groups of larger dogs is going to take even longer because there's a certain skill level and experience that you have to have to work with larger groups of dogs by yourself. But I think what Susan and I see most often is that people expect that to happen within about five days. Like, so next time you're complaining, this is what I'm going to just challenge you to do. Next time you find yourself complaining because staff A doesn't whoever that person is who's a new employee hasn't done something right just jot down on a piece of paper how many days they've worked because we see those complaints well before the time frame you guys are giving so we'll get people that are like he's been here three weeks and he can't do anything and i'm like three weeks isn't really that long when it comes right down to it to like manage a group of dogs and i would rather have somebody say i'm not really ready for this than to have them just go in there and get, let a dog get injured. So, or we see it a lot after two weeks too. We see the person that's like, you know, two weeks later, they still can't figure out the flow of which dog should go outside and which dog should go to the daycare room and which dog should be going into a grooming route, whatever. We see that. So just start looking at that when you're getting frustrated with your staff and really take a look at how long have they actually worked there. And then going back to what does your formal training program say they should know by the end of week two? 
oh, you don't have one. But I think there's a lot of people out there that expect someone to know everything to really take care of the pets and work independently. And even three weeks is unrealistic. They need checklists. They need SOPs to go back to. And they just could not possibly have gone through all the technical knowledge they need as far as health and wellness and dog behavior and even knowing all the breeds. I mean, I think we underestimate how much we really expect people to know and the amount of time we're giving them to absorb all of this at one time and know it in three weeks. It's going to be a jumbled mess up there. They're not going to be able to put it in sequence and apply it as you want them to on the job. And there's knowledge and then there's skills. And so knowing the difference and how are you training and presenting that information. So in most states, I'll let you guys put this down or else Susan can address it because she looked this up. But in most states, think about that person getting a driver's license. How much training do they have to have before they get a license? And I'll let you talk to because I know you recently looked this up for a couple of states, Susan. Yeah. Well, it was like 30 hours of driving experience and at least 10 hours of that had to be at night. Um, and so 30 hours and, you know, you're saying two weeks would be if they're full time, 80 hours. But are they learning that all in those first 14 days? Because the absorption and applying, they're going to be overwhelmed. I'll just tell you right now, you would do better to spread that 80 hours out over the three month probationary period and to give deliver it in small chunks. So they master something. And before you start adding on new content and skills. So think yeah. about oh, I was going to say, I'll tell you as someone who let her husband train two kids <laughs> how to drive. Cause I didn't want to do it. Um, you know, those are my kids had to do, I think 40 hours and 10 of those did have to be at night in Virginia at the time, way before they got on the, on the drive, you know, on an actual road, we did lots of hours in a parking lot of a school. Those hours we weren't counting towards their driving hours. Driving hours are like, you're literally driving on the road somewhere. And I can tell you that's still not 40 hours is when you, when they get their license, you're not, you're not sitting back on, well, I got 40 hours. They're like an experienced driver because drive then the country by yourself. <laughs> exactly. And then for, for Virginia, at least after, and this might've changed. I can't, I can't remember. It's been a couple of years, but after they got their license for the next year, they could not drive anybody in the car with them except for their family which is kind of weird because apparently that nobody cares if the family dies in that car, but, <laughs> but they couldn't drive any of their friends. Um, I think that's a stretch. Right. And so I know the family is going to not distract them at all. Yeah. So you have to look at that and, you know, and then we all say, well, of course, because they're driving this big car and they're, this is human lives. Well, I will tell you that when you bring someone into your facility, you're dealing with, not human lives, but you're dealing with lives of valued family members and that is the same risk. So anyone that brings, you know, a new employee in and thinks, Oh, we should just leave them alone after just a few hours. And again, that, that 40 hours of driving experience, like Susan said, I would never just have my kid drive for 40 hours in one week and think that that gave them experience because in between, you know, it was days in between, <laughs> the practice times and in between those times they're watching myself or my husband drive. And then we're giving them tips about what we're doing or what we're seeing. Or, I mean, I do think it's really, we, we tend to be unrealistic on how quickly people can learn. So, but I also think that what is important is to have a plan. And so you should have a written plan and somebody, I think just earlier said checklist, I would have checklists as well. Like what, what do you actually expect a person to know after a first week? if they're full time or whatever, if they're part time, maybe it's a longer period of time, but what do you really want them to know? And Susan and I would say cleaning is like one of the first things they should know. Somebody said that earlier because it is one of the things they can do really quickly without a lot of supervision, but they have to be trained what to do and what to clean and how to clean it and how to mix the chemicals safely and all of that. But by the end of week one, should they know how to clean everything? Maybe, 
But then what about by the end of week two, what are you expecting them in week three and week four? And that should go out, you know, till you can, sh you actually have a training plan to, to teach them everything they need to know, which is a lot of time and effort. But if you can put that training plan together, it's going to save you a ton of time in the long run. You're going to hire the 18 people who get in there and are like, okay, this is very organized. This, I totally know what's expected of me. You're going to actually have something to hold them accountable for because it's written down and you have policies hopefully and procedures in place that you can say you're either doing it or you're not. Again, it's not just you didn't clean it the way I wanted based on what's in my head. You cleaned it, the, you didn't clean it the way I wanted based on the policies we have. And then you also have a way to go back and test their knowledge, which Susan talked about earlier, where after four weeks, you could just go back and ask them a few questions. Like by the end of the first month, you should know this, 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 and this. Let me just ask you a few questions to make sure you're understanding those things. So that formal training program for onboarding a new employee is really important. And I think that there's a lot of room for improvement with most facilities that we work with in that area. I'm gonna put a link to the uh, membership site, Susan, if you wanna talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we've heard frustration of having an organized training plan. And so we have, done that. Uh, we've had knowing dogs for years, which has been um, proven to be a great tool to help you train people to understand canine body language, safely greet dogs, um, and to lead dogs in play groups. But there was a lot of things that were not in Pet Guru College that we felt was important um, in pet care. We didn't cover um, what is a healthy pet look like at different ages. Um, what are common diseases, um, what type of parasites can pets get. And so we have expanded our curriculum and content and created what we are very proud of now as Pet Guru College, which includes Knowing Dogs that has 67 other modules around that. And it's set up by role, which means that if you're a daycare counselor, you have your training plan laid out by week. We have a lodging counselor. We have an enrichment counselor, which would be a career path for a daycare counselor to um, expand into. And then we have a client care counselor. Um, and client care does need to know a lot of dog stuff to stay safe and to be able to put in good instructions. Um, but they need to know a lot about customer service and client care. So we've built that in. And then Robin, you want to talk about what we've done for teamwork and soft skills? Yeah. So then we also included in that all of the soft skills, because it's funny, everybody just assumes that people should know they should show up for work on time and that they should have a good work ethic and that they should be, you know, responsible to the rest of the team. That's what we all want. And we just all assume that's just something taught to people. I can tell you it's not. And it maybe at some point it was, but I think now we do have to specifically say, yes, we expect you to show up on work on time. We expect you to be a team player. And this is what that looks like in regards to the other employees, you know, that are working with you. And so we've actually done several lessons on what we would call how to be a team player, how to be a responsible employee to actually teach that stuff. So again, it's not, it's not somebody's expectation based on whatever you're thinking in your head. And they may not have the same starting point in terms of their values about what a team player looks like. So we actually have done a lot of sessions on those. And then we did a lot of varying types of videos. So we did some animated videos because we didn't want to do all PowerPoint. We did some PowerPoint. We did some animated videos. We did some videos of me and Susan talking and demonstrating. So it's a, it's a whole, training program that you can use for their staff. So you can take a look at that. I put the link in the website, um, the doggers.com forward slash membership, and you'll see the three different types of memberships we have for that. Um, and then I would say the last, oh, wait, we had a question real quick. Uh, hang on. Linda said, well, love your products. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, does your new college guide include customer service phone templates by chance? Well, there's a communications course that includes more um, that does have some guides. It depends on what you mean by templates, because we're not going to set your SOPs and how you handle things, but we do cover the basics of 
what's expected to be a pet care professional and to communicate with clients and with their team members. Um, there is a module on selling with integrity that's part of the client care counselor, which does talk about um, providing selling according to value. Um, so I, that's a little hard to answer. I think there's a lot of resources there, but we wouldn't want to say that this is a template you should use because it may not be what every brand wants. So we, we try to provide the basic knowledge so that you can provide the specifics for your brand and your SOPs. Yeah. And I, and I will say that Pet Guru College is intended to be used along with your SOP. So we're not dictating your policies or procedures. We're dictating best practices for how to train and what the average, but obviously we talk about, the importance we talk about in Pet Guru College, the importance of mixing chemicals right and knowing which chemicals are not shouldn't be mixed and knowing where the chemical data sheets are. We talk about that, but we don't say you have to clean with solution XYZ because that's up to your policies and procedures, a lot of which is based on what products that you have in your facility. So Pet Guru College is the training program, but it does go hand in hand with your SOP, which hopefully you have. Well, and we have a lot of leader tools like the communications course has some leader tools that would help you create those and make it easier to create them, create those for your center. Just like with knowing dogs, there are leader tools. Um, so there's leader tools for the communication course, knowing dogs, and then for Pet Guru College um, to give you some ideas on SOPs and things that we believe are best practices in the event you have that in your SOPs right now. And then I was going to say, just to close this up, the last thing that I would really say to look at in terms of bringing in those 18 players is looking at yourself. And I think Susan and I probably more often have the conversation with people about whether or not they're a good manager or leader, as opposed to, are you hiring the right people? Because a lot of times you might bring in the right person, but managing and leading employees are two separate things. And an entrepreneur doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you can start a company, build a company, grow a company, have a great company. Doesn't necessarily mean you're really good at managing your staff or your team. And sometimes I actually think that entrepreneurs make really lousy managers, to be honest. And so you really have to maybe get education yourself on what it means to be a really good person. Because if your employees don't like you, you can pay them all you want. That doesn't, they're not going to stay and work with you. I mean, part of, part of being that dream team is everybody has mutual respect and um, friendship in not in a way of like you're all going out and partying together, but enough that you're kind to each other, you're respectful to each other, you're honest with each other. I mean, those are really important. And some, I do find that some pet care entrepreneurs are not built that way. They just, they want the job done. They want it done how they want it. And they're just not good at teaching and leading. So you might have to get some help, you know, through other resources for that as well to improve your own skills in terms of, leading and managing your team. I don't know, Susan, if you want to add to that. No, I mean, I think picking your training leader is really important. They should be really patient, really good with people and good at explaining how to do things because not everybody is. So it may not be your best doer of the job. It's going to be the person that's the best at teaching. And those are very different skills and that's okay. You may also want to have who your training leader is, but then have a peer mentor that they can go to for questions because for your 18 players, you want them to feel that there's support and um, network there for them as they're learning the job. But you need to do it with patience and to give them time to truly really absorb and know and learn the tools before you expect them to execute on their own. Yeah. So Jen said, I've been a horrible manager at time, constantly improving and learning. I love that. And Edmund said guilty too. So I love that you guys are um, able to say that I'm a, I, one of the best decisions I ever made was to hire someone else that took over my training that became my training manager for my staff. Those are the best decision I ever made. Cause I really wasn't that good at it. I wasn't awful, but I think if you asked my employees, hey, who was the better uh, leading of the team for the staff, Robin or Kathy, who was the person I hired, 
hands down, they would have all said Kathy. She was just much better at taking, um, taking that role and being and mentoring and coaching and leading them than I was. And so that I do think you need to be honest about that. And and believe me, I've gotten a lot better. But it's it is something that I sought out to learn about so that I could be better. But I th and I think really taking care of your employees is vital, which means that you really need to care about them, not just when they're working at your facility, but you know, do you know anything about their lives? Do you know anything about what's going on with them? And are you asking those questions? And, and it needs to come from a place of genuine care and concern, but I think that's what makes a better team is when you have that kind of a relationship with your employees and you can, you know, you're looking out for them, not just because they're helping you make money but you're looking out for them because you truly care about them. So I do think that's really important. And I think when we get frustrated with our teams, I think one of the first directions we need to look is inward at our own, um, you know, at our own issues that might help that we might want to work on to help become a better team leader for them. Yeah. When you've got new employees coming on board, if you really want to, reduce your turnover and keep people longer. You have got to do like Robin said, be organized, have a plan and have someone that's going to be dedicated to their development for the first 90 days. Now it this may not be full time, but that's talking and working with them every day for probably at least an hour a day, if not two. Um, it's, going to save you money in the long run. Everyone says, I don't have time. Well, if you don't put time in, you're just going to keep churning. And that's what we hear. Churn, churn, churn. I can't keep anybody. Yeah. And that's really what we want to resolve. Um, Linda Huss said, you offer an outright purchase price for the college. Um, we don't because it's an online monthly subscription service. So it is based on the fact that usually you're training employees for many months. So there's not a way to purchase it for one price because it's a subscription service. Um, the monthly subscription allows you to train up to 30 people at a time. So it is set up so that once you get on the LMS, you can add your employees, you can then assign them whatever roles. And again, um, enrichment counselor, for instance, is a career role that we would give to somebody in daycare. So you may, in a perfect world, you would hire somebody for daycare and they would go through the daycare onboarding. And then at some point you would say, Hey, we want to now train you to be an enrichment counselor. And then you could give them access to the second, the next role. So it is, if you cross train, there's again, four different roles to train. So it's not, that's not going to happen all at once. It is going to depend on your employees. So we actually set it up so that we know it's going to take several months, which is why it's a subscription. So um, that's the answer for that. Um, so Katie said, toughest thing to do is admit the things we aren't good at. I've learned to hire people with the skills I'm not comfortable with. That's such an awesome, like uh, such an awesome way to end this Facebook live. That's, that's so true. And I think sometimes we like to think we're good at everything and really just figure out what you're really good at and then bring somebody in that can do the other stuff. So I love that. And then, okay, one last question, and then we'll let everyone go. Um, client care counselor teaching our front desk and other staff to work with humans as clients, or is that working about working with dogs? That's working with humans. I mean, I think we we do include education on um, animal care that is relevant to keeping them safe and for them also to do their job, because a lot of times your animal care counselor is the one interacting with the human to get instructions on feeding and medication. So it's important for them to understand that. And they are often um, interacting with pets at the front desk. So we want them to stay safe. And there's just certain things I think general knowledge they should know. So client care is primarily about dealing with customers, but we are providing, we felt like the animal knowledge that they need to do the job and also to keep themselves safe and to communicate with clients about what's happening at the center. Cause they yeah. have to sell services too. So, the more they understand, um, I think the better they can be at selling services. So we appreciate everyone's time today for our 30 minute, that always goes 60 minutes Facebook live session. <laughs> I'm like, this is only gonna take 30 minutes. Um, but we appreciate all of you guys that stick around and hear from us. We will, someone earlier asked about seeing this again. It will be on Facebook, um, but it will be on our COVID-19 page as well. So we always post it there. and. 
we're working on taking all the Facebook lives and putting them into YouTube in the future so that all of these will be accessible later. And then if you want to continue the conversation or you want to talk to me and Susan, plus others who are in the industry, we do have a Facebook page. I put a link to that. It's called grow your care business. It's a uh, free page to join and we just have all kinds of other members. So it's a great way to just start discussions. We uh, pride ourselves on being friendly. If you are mean on that page, I will delete you. And uh, we don't, we try to not have people selling stuff on that page. So if you post something um, for sale, I will also delete you. But, the, but that makes it a good fun page, hopefully of nice people who are really trying to help one another. So join us over there and um, Susan and I are on that page, but there are so many other great folks on there as well. And you'll get lots of ideas if you have questions on anything. And uh, Jess is our moderator over there and she does a great job of keeping things going as well. So thank you for joining us. If you have questions, let us know. And otherwise we will see everybody hopefully next week on another Facebook Live. Good luck in your hiring 18 players. <laughs> <laughs>